TJ, looks like we're live, brother. Good morning. Good morning. Let's talk about some sponsors that pay for this whole little parade of ours to be on the show. We got sponsors like the American Warrior Society, man. Uh, you know what makes a great, a great stocking stuffer? A membership to the American Warrior Society. Nothing says I care about your safety and security like a membership to the American Warrior Society. So please check it out. If you've been enjoying this content and you got that weird brother-in-law that needs it, uh, then go ahead and hook it, hook that dude up with a membership to the American Warrior Society. We also have the Century Martial Arts uh, Makers of the Bob, the Body Opponent Bag, extra long so you can get those good uh, thigh-high leg strikes in. You can choke and put a gi top on Bob, strangle his ass, take him to the range, made him eat eat all the 556 five, you want. Bob is an amazing training tool. Again, why run on a treadmill when you can get a good strike workout in on Bob? He doesn't mind. Check out the links in today's show, AmericanWarriorShow.com. I have a link to you. Right-hand side of the page, all of our amazing sponsors that make the show possible can be found there with deep discount codes for all those watching today. We also have my good buddy, Jesse Ross. We were in the Marine Corps together. Jesse's a retired gunnery sergeant. Him and his family are growing some of the finest CBD products money can buy. They have everything from tinctures to salves. Now, they are full spectrum, so you will pop positive on a urinalysis if you use their products, but not if you use the salves. I find that with at my advanced uh, age, they really help me with my joint problems. I've had Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain. I got three knee surgeries and doing jujitsu like I am going to be doing tonight with a bunch of young folks. is really tough on this old body, so I take some CBD drops to take care of that. We also had the cool fire trainer, cool fire trainer, man. Why dry fire when you can cool fire? Dry fire in a so like 1960s, it's Colonel Cooper stuff, man. You want to get yourself a cool fire trainer because it's going to take that dry fire game to the next level. One of the things uh, one of our guests talked about, he has a cool fire trainer, and he said that that felt recoil when you first pump it up is so much it really causes you to tighten down that grip, or else that firearm will just fly right out of your hand. Remember, folks, it's your gun. Your grip panel, your your sights, your trigger, everything is your gun. You just replace the barrel and the recoil spring, and you get felt recoil. Please check out Cool Fire Trainer. Mountain Man Medical, man. I've said it and said it, and, and I'll say it again, folks. You're going to have to get that trauma kit. If you carry something in your waistband that's going to give the ability to put holes in people, you're going to want to have something to be able to patch those holes because one of the holes could be in someone you care about. Make sure... You get one, a co-branded trauma kit from Mountain Man Medical and the American Warrior Society. It has everything you need to deal with what life throws at you. And it's at a very modest price point, especially given the inflation that we're experiencing right now. Last but not least, Precision Holsters, man. Maker of the Ultra Appendix rig that I'm currently wearing as well as the as their uh, concealment belt. So they have everything that you need over there. They have competition line. They have a, a, a line of amazing concealment products. I really can't say enough about what they do over there at Precision Holster, so please check them out. I got 15 folks joining us live. Before I get into today's show, you're going to want to hit that share button. Share this content into a group. If you're a member of an IDPA or USPSA group, share it there. If you're a member of some other training addicts group, please share it. Uh, I've been wanting to get TJ on the show for a while now, and he's been gracious enough with his time to, to spend this morning with us, so thanks, TJ. Looking forward to it, Rich. Let's welcome some folks on the show, brother, before we uh, read your amazing bio and get into it. My good friend, Will Parker, out there in Montana, coin number 800. John Shriver is on from Yukon, Oklahoma, coin number 1919. If you want to find out what a coin number is, please check out American Warrior Society and find out if becoming a member of our self-defense community is the right thing for you. Uh, we have Tina is on, says, good morning. Betty is on, says, good morning, Warriors, coin number 18. Jared is on, coin number 895 out there in Montana as well. Will is on, Jesse is on, Tony, Skip, Peter. Wow, i got a lot of folks on, Rasmick, and Mr. Mike Seeklander is on. He says, please take a minute to share. Dr. Gordon Botson is on as well. So, TJ, let me read your bio, brother, and we'll get into it. TJ is a sworn law enforcement officer and police sergeant in a major police department that has services one of the largest cities in the nation. During his tenure in law enforcement, TJ has held numerous assignments. As a sergeant, he has performed his duties in the roles of range master of the Advanced Training Firearms Unit, 
range master of the Regional Police Academy, federal task force officer, violent crimes investigative sergeant, field training sergeant, and patrol sergeant. TJ has directly supervised numerous critical and high profile incidents and has extensive uh, history in operational policing. TJ developed and taught a number of leadership courses for his department, including a leadership prerequisite course for promotional processes and first line leadership for field training officers. Prior to promoting to the rank of sergeant, TJ held a number of operational assignments as an officer where he participated in countless investigations and tactical operations. TJ completed his undergraduate degree at Ottawa University in public safety and administration and leadership. TJ is a United States Marine Corps veteran and owns HVL LLC, which is an NFA FFL. Good morning, TJ. Good morning, Rich. Thanks for having me. Yeah, brother, man. I always ask the guests this. What does your bio overlook? Well, um, you know, it sounds all pretty sexy when you say it like that, but I'm actually kind of just a regular guy. I got a family and kids and um, generally what I'm doing with my time when I'm not working one of my um, working either for the, the gun business or uh, police stuff is trying to find time with my kids and time to train jujitsu time to, to build the relationships for all the things that are going to still be there when I'm done doing these jobs. So I guess I'm a, I'm kind of a, a boring family man when I'm not doing all these other things. That's it, man. <clears throat> That's what it's all about. Because I, like you said, man, eventually, uh, you know, all the cool guy stuff fades away and you're left with your family. And that's kind of where I find myself, you know, on this farm in East Tennessee. I went to a buddy's retirement over the weekend up in Lexington, Kentucky, retired Lieutenant Colonel. And eventually it all fades away. And I, what I loved about his retirement speech is he's like, everybody in here has something to do with my career. But let me talk about the three most important people. And he looked at his his wife and his son and his daughter and, and went down the line thank them and and then closed out the, the retirement. I'm like, that's, that's it, man. Cause they're the ones that bear a lot of the burden of what we war fighters do. Oh yeah. They're the victims of our success for sure. They, they put up with a lot and, you know, behind every, uh, every good man, I think has a good family and a good base that supports them. Cause it's not an easy job to do. My God bless my wife, man, for being able to put up with me. Yeah. Yesterday was uh, 35 years from mine and my wife's, first date back in high school <clears throat> and uh you know we celebrated that day and it's, it's just a miracle man that uh we beat every single statistic you know <laughs> we should have been divorced when i was a lance corporal you know what i'm saying yeah i got divorced when i was a lance corporal so i know exactly what you're saying <laughs> you know what i'm saying <laughs> that's exactly what i'm getting at all my lance corporal buddies got divorced with me oh yeah well i was one of those ones that thought i was pretty smart when i was 18 years old and you know, I pretty got this figured out, you know, I'll just get married. And uh, my uh, high school sweetheart, she was 17 at the time. And for some reason, her parents and everyone else said, yeah, this is a good idea. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? You know, so she's a good girl, though. She lives in Tennessee now. and You know, I wish her well on her birthdays and stuff like that. But no, no bad blood is just I was a, a young, stupid kid. I had no business doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, speaking of the Marine Corps, and if you don't know what a Lance Corporal is, that's a pretty junior rank in the Marine Corps, but it is definitely the backbone of the Marine Corps. Matter of fact, I, I loved being a Lance Corporal so much. I was a Lance Corporal twice, TJ, when I got busted. <laughs> I, was, I think all the best Marines get to view Lance Corporal more than once. Yeah. What, I, you know, it's what's weird. And I ended up becoming an officer and I remember my good conduct ribbon. You know, I was a gunnery sergeant with a good conduct. I had no stars on it. And I was like, see that pal because i'm stupid i make i do dumb stuff but uh so what was your time in the marine corps like we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on it but you are a marine corps veteran i want to ask you about it well you know what i was uh um i think i i had a as i started getting towards the end of high school i, I was a kid that did everything early right so i was i was walking before i should walk i was uh um running before I should run. And as I continued to grow up, it was like everything was a full on sprint to the next thing. So when I hit about 16, I started hanging out with some stupid people. My grandfather was a Korean war vet and 
just a hell of a man. And he kind of grabbed me by the, by the neck one day and said, Hey man, I think you need to get out of town. Yeah, I think you're probably right. So, uh, 17 years old, found myself on the, uh, yellow footprints. Um, I thought I knew quite a bit about the world at that time. I found out really quickly that I did not, um, real eye-opening experience for me. I was the youngest Marine at the birthday ball two years in a row, if that tells you wow. anything. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, and everything in my life has kind of been like the, you know, I, I always seem to be the youngest of my peers or the youngest of my, uh, my group. My, I was the youngest guy in my academy class in the police academy. And, uh, you know, people are like, oh, that's, you know, just, that's good. You kind of got in everything early and I'm like, well, yeah, yes and no. It would mean that I was young and stupid enough to mess everything up real good the first time and uh, learn just about every lesson I've ever learned the hard way. I think your volume went out, Rich. Of course it did, course. TJ. I'm always muting myself, bro. I step on my own landmines. That's what I do. But uh, yeah, I moved out of the house at 18 and joined the Marine Corps and thought I knew everything and made a lot of mistakes, but uh, I wouldn't change it. So uh, tell me about BJJ. How long have you been doing that? And what got you into BJJ? Uh, well, I started doing it when I was in the Marine Corps. Um, and I think that was just part of the the culture of Marines was hand combat was a big part of it. And, um, my, uh, my buddies and I used to, we, we pull these, uh, mats out of the whiskey locker that were had, they probably weren't good for doing jujitsu on, but they were better than concrete. And we'd pull those out <laughs> and, uh, move all of the bunk beds out of the uh, way and uh, with the barracks and go in there. And we would had no idea what we were doing, but we would just go in there and practice and, and try things and, um, hurt each other basically. And, I kind of fell in love with it then. Um, I uh, when I became a police officer, um, my career started taking off, and I I put it away for quite a few years. Stopped doing it. Um, really lost a lot of of what I had, and then um, I don't know, three four years ago, I started picking it back up again and getting back into it again, and went through the uh, humbling process all over again. You could say of um learning how to endure pressure and realizing um the re-realizing the philosophy of the uh 18 stripe white belt uh you know what i mean and that uh brazilian jiu-jitsu is the ultimate truth teller about people um and that the mats don't lie about you uh, they don't lie about what you are or what you're capable of um you either perform or you don't, you either get humbled, um, or you learn. And the, the, I think those things just continue to happen over time. So it's, it's like the great equalizer of ego for men like us, I think, in that, um, one, it, it, it keeps us young. It conditions our bodies. It, it helps us to have good relationships with other men from, from our tribes. But at the same time, I think, um, it keeps us in check with ourselves and, and keeps um, hard men in balance. Uh, it's easy to forget um, how defeatable we are when we stop training. Um, and we kind of tell ourselves, we build these, these thrones for ourselves that we sit on that, that uh, tell us how excellent we are. The thing I really like about jujitsu is it doesn't let you forget uh, it doesn't let you forget that you are just as capable of losing as you are of winning. And that for me, it keeps that drive inside of me, the drive to progress, the drive to continue trying, um, and the mentality that I'm never on top of the mountain. I'm always working my way up. Once you get up to the top, there's only one way you can go. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I got, uh, I got a text yesterday when you and I were texting. I was also texting with my buddy, uh, Todd Fox. Let's see here. I believe he won the Naga World Championship over the weekend in Dallas. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. But uh, 
he posted about it on Instagram and, and I guess he won by points and he's like, that ain't a win. <laughs> and I congratulate him and he, and he gave me a thumbs down on the text and uh, I get what he's talking about. He's like, you know, this is, I don't want to ever win by points. Cause if I, if I get defeated by points, I don't care. You, know, right. you had an opportunity to submit me. If you didn't submit me, then, and that's all I need to know. And I, sometimes life is binary like that, right? It's, it's there's no real luck. This isn't a video game in life. You know, there's no like, Hey, on that, on that entry, man, I, uh, you came up two points shy that that's not the way life works. So I, I kind of appreciate his philosophy. What do you think? Yeah, it's, it's hard in competition when you're doing a competitive sport, you have to be able to create rules for who the winner is going to be, especially when you've got multiple contestants. So I, you know, IBJJF, I understand the philosophy behind what they created um, and why those points exist, but I like the uh, Hicks and Gracie idea of, Hey, let's just see who wins and not, not run a timer. And uh, at, at a certain point, one of us is going to tuck her out and the, and the guy that wants this more is going to be recognized and figured out. Um, so I enjoy rolling without a timer um, and just going to submission, whether it's me getting submitted. Um, when I train jujitsu, I like to, I'm kind of strategic about how I pick my, my rolling partners, like after a class, if I go to a class, I, um, my first role, I'm usually looking for somebody that's about my size, about my same skill level. Um, and I, that's kind of my, my warm up role. You know, I want to pick somebody who's the, the closest version of me that's in the gym. And I'll start with that. And my second role, I'm looking for the heaviest guy that I know is 10 times stronger than me. I know he's going to overpower me. I know he's going to try to smother me. Um, and it's probably unwise, but um, I try to put myself in in positions where I'm uncomfortable and and see how long I can meditate there. Um, and I actually, again, not to bring up Hicks in again, but I I sort of adopted that idea from Hicks and Gracie when he's telling a story about having his brother wrap him up in a uh, you know carpet and sit on his head because I um, I want to feel comfortable under pressure. And after I've done that, I, I will pick a technical role. I'll find a belt higher than me, somebody that I know um, can out jujitsu me. Now, size is not necessarily applicable in that role. I'm just looking for somebody who I know is more talented than I am. Um, and I, I feel like once you've gotten the pressure part out of the way, everything else becomes a lot easier. So I find that those more difficult roles, those more technical roles are a lot easier for me after I've been smashed. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's one of those, you know, kind of constantly like jujitsu is one of those things that's constantly modifying and updating itself as a sport, but, as a person, I'm not, I'm not so interested with points. I, I do think that there's a little bit of a disconnect between lab or gym, you know, traditional training academy with jujitsu and what I have seen happen out on asphalt and what I've seen happen out on concrete. And so I, I agree with you, you know, points, points are cool in a, in a tournament and it's cool to win. Um, but I'm a little bit, uh, you know, violence on the street is a lot more concerning to me. And so I try to be more pragmatic about um, how I'm going to solve a problem. If I'm putting my hands on somebody with the intention of hurting or subduing them and training to win by points is excellent if you are training for competition, but it is not a good way to train if you're training to um, be able to defend your family or to be able to defend yourself or somebody else. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. And <clears throat> one of the things you mentioned that in the Marine Corps, uh, you had some old mats that probably weren't good for jujitsu, but, and, and every now and then you probably need to train on a hard surface, like a, a basketball uh, gymnasium floor or concrete with the right training partners uh, because uh, the mats can give you a false sense of security. I went to a 
seminar several years back from a well-known guy, and I don't won't say his name because I, I respect the hell out of him, but he was like, uh, he comes like, hey, Rich, you know, uh, you really need to put your knees on the mat, you know, instead of your knees on your training partner. And I'm like, okay, yes, sir. But I'm like, you've never been a cop. You, you've never... <laughs> You've never had your knees on the ass, hot asphalt and stuff like that. Now, I think a lot of departments are making their officers get away with that kind of stuff. I mean, I know New York did. Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> neon belly is very, very powerful on the street. It, it works very well. Yes. It, it doesn't just work on a jujitsu floor. Um, and when you start pushing on somebody's diaphragm, you start pushing on somebody's gut. Um, normal people are not accustomed to that type of pressure. And to me, like, look, if I'm arresting somebody now more than ever in the history of policing, it's important to do things in a way that other people seeing can understand what you're doing and why you're doing it and that they don't perceive what you're doing as something that was unnecessary, right? Because it gives the whole profession a black eye when we have people that are generally speaking undertrained or underprepared and they go into situations and they overreact, right? If I, if I can make a guy quit, even take violence out of it. If I can make a guy quit by saying like, Hey man, uh, sit the fuck down. Mm -hmm. And instead of it, hey, you know, sir, I'd like you to sit down on the ground and okay, well, can that be offensive to some people? Sure. Absolutely. It can. But let me ask you this. If he sits down on the ground and submits to me because I growled at him, right? I gave him that proverbial growl by using violent language. And he perceives that the next step after that growl is going to be violence. If he doesn't comply with me and his choice is to comply uh, is that not a de-escalation technique in and of itself? Right. Right. Of so, um, but when it comes time to, to put your hands on people, I found that there's, there's ways of doing that, that really don't look bad, uh -huh. um, that are, are very uncomfortable for people to be very uncomfortable positions for people to be in. Um, so, you know, if there's an agency that's telling people they, they can't put knees on people, I mean, I understand the excited delirium, you know, stuff with people that are on dope and keeping them face down with their chest compressed on the ground for a long period of time and, and why that's dangerous. Um, but gaining compliance of somebody by utilizing pressure um, rather than utilizing, would, you know, would you rather me knee somebody in the face to make them listen to me or would you rather me put my knee in their belly? You know, once somebody's made the decision that they're not going to comply with me unless I'm physical, I my options start scaling up dramatically until I get what it is that I'm looking for. I'm trying, generally speaking, to start at the bottom of that scale and work my way up. Um, like I said, language is one of the most underutilized tools that we have. And I was one of them, so I'm not saying this judgmentally, but a lot of these young officers that are on now, that's, I think, where they struggle the most in getting compliance is right out of the gate of how are we communicating with people, right? And in, even in our police academy, the, the sentiment of, of how they teach these kids is, well, like, you got to let them know that you're serious, right? You got to yell at them and you got to, you know, they got to believe you. And to me, I'm, I'm more terrified of the guy that's calm and has a little bit of a smirk on his face than the guy that appears to be losing emo emotional control. So <clears throat> I tell my guys, you know, yelling usually does less mm -hmm. for you. The second that, that, that somebody that you're engaging with gets the impression that you're losing control of your own emotions, they own you. Yeah. So the calmer that you become as people amp themselves up and you get calmer when they amp up, it's scary to, to watch somebody not be concerned with you starting to, you know, act violently. I think, you know, that was a little bit of a rant that I just went on, but really at its core, we as a, as a nation are not doing a good job at preparing our young officers on how to engage in violence appropriately. 
Yeah. On that, you know, non-reactivity is an, is an art, you know, being non, being non-reactive. And I think that a lot of it comes basically from being confident in your own abilities. If you're confident in your own abilities, you're not going to, you're not going to over-escalate, you know, you're not, you are going to just kind of smirk and like, Oh, I see where this is going. Uh, and I think that a lot of people don't, they miss that. And I had a, I had a long conversation over dinner. We were tr training a, a very large federal agency a few months ago and the, the head of their firearms training program and, and several of the other agents were having dinner with us. And he's like, Rich, I'm that guy you were talking about today. And I said, what do you mean by that, sir? And he says, well, I'm the guy that would never, ever cuss a suspect. I'm like, you would never use foul language? And he's like, no, never. And this guy's a former Marine, an absolute animal, a stud. I love this guy, but he's his religious convictions uh, make him feel that uh, use of foul language is never appropriate. And I said, so Manas Arriba, and he raised his hands. And I'm like, exactly. I have to speak the language of the person I'm talking to. And if, if you think that this scumbag in a dark alley in the middle of the night doesn't use profanity as a punctuation mark, right? then you're wrong. And the other thing is I told him, I said, I have a problem with anybody that says I'm going to burn somebody down and take their life away from them and take everything they've ever had by killing them. And you'll do that, but you won't use foul language in their presence. I don't understand that, that logic. And I love this guy. I highly respect him, but I just can't follow that reasoning. Well, my question to him would be what if foul language was going to be what um, the, the tool that, kept you from having to kill somebody or kept yeah. you from having to use violence on somebody. There's, you know, I really, uh, I really, really enjoy listening to Steven Pinker talk on this. You know, he's a, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you know who he is. He's a clinical uh, psychologist. Harvard. Yeah. Grad. I read his book, the blank slate. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Uh, he's got some good videos. They're actually kind of old and um, they look like something that your teacher would have wheeled into your classroom and stuck a VCR into the, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, portable television to play for you. But he, he talks about the different utiliz utilizations of, of violent language or of profanity. Um, and I think it is a way to growl at people. Uh, and it's an, it can be an effective way to growl at people. But you have to understand how you're doing it and how. So let me tell you a story. So I was a, a young police officer and uh, work in a really violent area of town. Um, and it was predominantly non-English speaking Hispanic community. So I would go <laughs> to all these calls and when I would go and I would walk up and I would knock on the door, I would go. <laughs> right. And that's how I would knock on people's doors. And all these people would open their doors and they would be just fuming mad when the door would open. Right. And I would. I would think to myself, like, man, these guys are kind of assholes, you know what I mean? Like, I don't understand why all these people just come flying out of their houses like this. I did this for probably a year, and one day I'm I'm riding with this. There's a new officer on the squad who actually grew up in Mexico. And so I, my boss says, hey, you're taking the new guy today. I take him in the car, and we go to a call, and I knock on a door like that. And he looks at me horrified. And he goes, what the fuck are you doing, man? I said, well, what do you mean? And he goes, are you, are you, do you know these people? I said, no, I, this is my first time ever being here. And he goes, do you know what that means? And I said, no. And he says, you basically just told them to go fuck themselves. <laughs> right. And, he, and it's from a song, right. That, that uh, kind of cadence that comes from like a really popular or a really well-known rather um, like Mexican national uh, I think it's a TV commercial or something like that, but it, it means go fuck your mother. Whoa. Right. So this whole time I I'm without even knowing it, I'm speaking a language to people that they find highly offensive <laughs> and finding myself in bad situations because of it. And I think that the utilization of profanity works in a very similar way. Sometimes if I want to be effective at communicating with people, I need to talk in a way that they can hear me. Um, and other times you have to realize that if you choose to use the, you know, the wrong kind of language or you use the type of language in the wrong way, that it can really backfire on you. If you go into a 
a Mexican national household and somebody gets the impression that you are berating them or trying to humiliate them because you're using violent language, but you're using it in a way that's degrading, right? Yeah. Saying and not saying like, uh, you know, put your fucking hands behind your back or yeah. but you're instead saying like, hey, you know, you're a real motherfucker, right? right. Well, in certain communities that are they are grow up and are raised in these traditional family honor sort of mentalities. You call a guy out in front of his whole family, whether he intended on being compliant with you in the beginning or not, he's probably going to have to fight you now because you're going to feel like he has to defend his honor. Correct. So you have to, when you're using that type of language, you have to understand that place and context and and the way that you're saying things and what you're saying matters it's not just a blanket slate of saying profanity is effective because profanity can be equally as ineffective as it can be effective right yeah yeah on that i've written about this uh quite a bit you know violence is a, is a think of it as a conversation yeah and and yeah. a lot of these people that you deal with are more uh they're better at that conversation than most people are the people that are raised on the street or that are criminals and how you and I know we don't normally cuss on this podcast but I think this is so important because you have to understand the person you're going to be interacting with and if they've chosen you for predation their their perception of you as is not good so you're going to have to combat right. that perception and then when when that perceptive fight and then when the physical fight and how you use profanity is is, is is like you alluded to tj is is so important like i came outside my house one time we did a show on it I, some meth guy was trying to break into my truck here on the farm and i'm you know I, i'm like hey man take your hands off my fucking truck you know just real calm and um uh, and i didn't say take take uh, your fucking hands off my truck. I said, take your hands off my fucking truck where that profanity goes. Cause I could insult him. And you know, you're, you're from Irish descent. I'm from Scots Irish descent where we are. We come from a culture of honor, very similar to the folks in rural Mexico. And if folks listening today, haven't read what Dr. Nisbet and his colleagues did uh, some research on the culture of honor. It's fascinating stuff, but you really need to understand it. Oh, yeah. because because you can get in a lot of trouble with these people you're going to force them into a position where they have to uh escalate the situation because they feel disrespected in their community am i right on that oh 100 percent. and and we all know and i'm sure you've probably met the police officer that just gets into fights all the time right mm -hmm. all the time he's shit just, magnet he's just constantly getting assaulted by other people um yeah. You know, I've had a number of those guys that have, I've worked around or have worked for me over the years. And when you start to break down what it is that's happening, is that whether or not people were going to comply or not comply, you start to bring there's 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 something that overrides uh, law and logic when you start calling somebody else out as a person or calling somebody else as a man. Um, and I think that there's a way to threaten somebody and threatening people is very, very important skill to be able to learn as a lawman or, or in any profession. I mean, effective threats is, is certainly a skill, but when you turn that into being ostentatious, um, and you're, you're just trying to, it comes into essentially uh, translating what you meant to be looking aggressive into acting provoking. Yeah. Um, and I would say that some of that is based on maturity of different people. Some of it certainly has a lot to do with ego. Uh, most of the people that I see behave that way, I don't think have been punched in the face before because um, there are some behaviors that are corrected through violence as well. Um, and you know, I, I don't, I don't really think that somebody should be a police officer that hasn't had their ass kicked at least once because, um, you, you need to understand what it's like to lose in a, in a real world environment, uh, to really have a good bead on how you're going to handle something and what hill you're going to die on or whether or not you really want to push somebody to a point where they're going to fight you over 
you know, whatever it is. There's a big difference between a transient sleeping under a bus that's technically violating a trespassing statute and rolling that bum out and then getting that guy to fight you than there is to go find a guy that's got fuck the police tattooed on his forehead uh, who's a convicted sex offender and just got out of prison for armed robbery. Those are two totally different types of human beings to interact with. And in police training, because it's so big, we get these cookie cutter um, sort of directions on how to handle people and how to um, deal with bad guys. And I think it's really important for, for officers to realize not all bad guys are the same. Um, you know, a doper and a, and a robber are not the same. Um, they can overlap one another in many cases, but the mindset of the person that you're coming across and being able to analyze what that mindset is, you know, we, uh, as our Dickens, he works for force science. Now, I don't know if you know who he is. Um, mm -hmm. he has this, uh, kind of real time threat assessment, call it a 15 second threat assessment matrix that he built, um, that I have found when I was a field training sergeant and, um, in other, um, parts of my, my career as a supervisor, I've given it to young officers and found it to be extraordinarily beneficial for somebody who is lacking experience and having to make the same decisions that an experienced person needs to make prior to having uh, the wisdom that came with the person who got experience. I, you know, the guy who has all of the experience, a lot of that experience is, comes from losing um, and a lot of wisdom comes from failure. Uh -huh. uh, but in 2021, a new officer is not allowed to fail in the same way that an officer in 2006 was allowed to fail. Yeah. So, um, you know, we tend to think of the person who's screaming and yelling and acting violent and breaking stuff as the most dangerous person. Um, but they're really not. Um, understanding how we're doing our business is an area that we're failing in as, as a profession right now, big time. Um, and a lot of the embarrassments that we've had as an organization and as a profession nationally have come from under preparing our officers. Now, I, I will say that, you know, we, we like to get really mad at people who are behaving a certain way, but you find me any mistake that went on that, that you or I or any other police officer would say was poor performance. And I will find you the leader who is responsible for it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Speaking of leadership, and we're going to shift gears, I want to come back to this conversation. But uh, I also want to get your uh, opinion on what makes a great instructor. And I ask you that because obviously you've had a tremendous amount of instructor time. Um, you know, I saw you uh, when I was out at your department, you know, at leading and mentoring a group of uh, really phenomenal instructors. What makes a good instructor, TJ? Well, as you know, a lot of those instructors that I supervised were far better instructors than I was. Um, and um, I, I really think that the, it's a blend of, of three things. The first one is the ability to read a room and having emotional intelligence like we talked about um, that translates into so many other things in life. But emotional intelligence is such an underutilized um, thing right now everybody is taught to to focus on themselves and their own thoughts and their own behaviors but very rarely are we trying to analyze um how people are perceiving us um and cops are really really hard to teach military guys are really really hard to teach the more experienced the room that you're talking to the more heavily critiqued you're going to be if you say something wrong Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that the way you approach a classroom and the, from starting from the introduction of yourself, the introduction of your co-instructors and, and your, your basic introduction of the course, 
um, that will set the stage for whether or not that entire class, you can ruin an entire class in the first 15 minutes if you do it the wrong way. Um, and a great instructor is able to go into a room, probably shows up early, probably starts to banter a little bit with people as they're coming in, pays attention to the conversations that are happening in the room while they're setting up their stuff and preparing all of their equipment. They're doing that, but they're also paying attention. They're listening to what people are saying. They're feeling the attitudes of whether people want to be there or not. In law enforcement, a lot of times people are at training, you know, against their will. It's mandatory and they don't have a choice, you know, and there is a big difference between a class somebody signed up for and a class somebody was told to be at. So as an instructor, looking at the room, reading the room, understanding, okay, this is where everybody's at. And, and t starting your approach from there on a way that's on their level, I think that's one of the most important things for an instructor to be able to master is figuring out how that engagement is going to go at the very beginning. And then you modify it as, as the class goes on, right? You scale it up or you scale it down depending on the classroom and the type of feedback that you're getting from you. But the the poorest instructors that i have seen are the instructors who are there to provide information and they're spending very little time perceiving right they're they're mm -hmm. spending a lot of time putting information out there and they're not spending a lot of time taking any information back um and that's you know some of it is people that you know there's a lot of different reasons why that can happen um less experienced teaching i think and people that are not new at being public speakers can tend to kind of forget you know like some one of the um, scholastic ways of learning to public speak is to tune out the room right pretend like the room's not there and that's something that's actually taught in academia right like <laughs> put yourself into your private headspace um, and while that may over that may help you to overcome your fear of public speaking, it certainly won't help you to become a, a professional instructor, you know. So yeah, you, you got to read the room. Absolutely. I would say the second um, most important thing about being a good instructor is, is being a good student. Um, the best instructors that I know, um, including you and Mike, when you guys came out and, and trained with us uh, and, you know, seeing you, have, you know, watching you guys watch my guys uh, as they were doing things. And, hey, why do you why are you doing that that way, Chris? Or what, you know, explain to me uh, your, your, you know, your thought process behind this approach to to what you're doing and getting feedback. And it was pretty clear to me um, that you guys were trying to learn something from us, too. Um, and the the guys that I know that are truly the tier one instructors, guys like Chris Palmer, who he, I know you have a lot of background with, um, mm -hmm. they're trying to be students just as much as they're trying to be teachers, right? As they're passing information along, they're trying to suck some uh, of your knowledge up and take it with them as well so that they can be more well-rounded. Um, and as soon as you self-proclaim yourself to be an expert on anything uh, in a room full of experts or on a field for a range full of experts. And that's a really dangerous path to go down because uh, while you might have gotten some grace for a mistake that you made um, when you're, you know, demoing, uh, say you're demoing uh, some type of firearms drill, right? And you could have demoed that drill and maybe done one or two things wrong and guys would have overlooked it. It's not like nobody's going to notice, right? The class is going to notice the other experts who are there are going to notice. But when you put yourself up on the superiority uh, pedestal, they're not going to forgive you for those things anymore. So um, I think that follows into probably the third thing that I think is more important, really important for an instructor is to um, have 
to not carry the mentality or the attitude that you have all of the answers and present yourself to your class as as a student instructor, right? As somebody who is progressive and believes in the evolution of training and the record, like Joe, like I was talking about earlier, right? An 18 stripe, 20 stripe white belt. Yeah, guys, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, you know what I mean? But I'm going to learn something from you today here too. And also being the first, we always like to think and imagine that when we make a mistake, if nobody says anything, it means nobody noticed. And that's not true, right? A lot of times nobody says anything, but that doesn't mean nobody noticed. The instructors that I know who are tier one guys, and I saw Mike Sieglander do this twice when you guys came out and trained with us. When he made a mistake, he stopped and said, guys, I messed that up. Right. And yep. he we all noticed it because we're all firearms instructors like, oh, that wasn't right. You know, but he was the one to say it. And you gain pointing out your own flaws and the ability to demonstrate humility in front of a room. We think it will, you know, our, our egos tell us, like, you'll view me as less if I make a mistake. So I have to pretend like it didn't happen. And that's not true. You gain credibility with people by saying, hey, guys, uh, I said this earlier. You know, I've done this in classes where I came back the next day and pulled people in and said, guys, yesterday, I know I told you this and I, I was wrong. Right. Talked to a couple other instructors from my cadre um, and I, I made a mistake on that. Here's the correct answer. Here's how I came to it. Right. And here's how we're all going to practice the right way together whatever. So that that uh, humility cannot be understated for a professional instructor. I mean, you take a guy like uh, there's so many world-class instructors out there. Um, you know, guys that, that I really, really, really respect as teachers. Um, and when they teach, they always seem to come in with a very, very similar approach of, we're learning together, right? We're growing together. We're getting like Rob Latham is a freaking fantastic example. Of, he's one of the, I mean, if he's not the GOAT, I don't know who is when it comes yeah. to firearms instructors. He's just tremendous. You know what I mean? So Robbie will announce, he's one of the few people I know who can do it as well. He'll announce somebody making a terrible mistake. Like, oh man, guys, everybody come over here and look. Right. TJ just screwed this up tremendously. And, you know, you wonder how he can do that because he's putting a lot of times he's putting a student on blast. Yeah. Like, hey, let's let's exploit this that just happened. But he does it in such a way that even the person who, you know, is being pointed out or, or kind of being put on blast is for whatever it was that they did feels like they're a part of the solution. Um, and the learning process of training and then other people are like, man, I don't have to make that mistake now too. And, you know, he's really good at bringing examples of his own mistakes in and his own flaws when he, when he trains. So if I am going to truly invest into an instructor, somebody who's teaching to me, somebody like Mike or somebody like Rob or somebody like you, I mean, I know a lot of good firearms instructors in, in this industry. Um, the ones who I stop and really, really pay attention to are the guys who I know are 20 strike white belts because that's how they behave. Right. Yeah. And they're going to let their performance be their performance. Right. And they're not, they're not too arrogant to say when they're wrong. They're not too arrogant to pretend like they haven't made mistakes. They understand Oftentimes, it's a tricky thing to, to teach other experts. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is a very, very tricky thing. And I know you know that because you've done a lot more of it than I have. Um, but it's, I, in my opinion, the most important thing about effective instructorship. I think I just lost you. Did I lose you? No. Nope. No, oh, still so got you. So that's my two cents. Sweet, man. I totally agree with all of everything you said. And that's, uh, you know, you talked about preparation there. You know, you talked about 
so many great things in there that, uh, yeah, te teaching other, t uh, being in a position where you're teaching other experts. I mean, it's different from like a brand new concealed carry class. When you walk into a room where everybody in there is an SME and, and you are too, and you're trying to impart stuff, if you pound on your chest and talk about how awesome you are, it's, it's going to fall flat, especially in a, a group of meat eaters, man. That's just not the way to, not the way to endear yourself to anybody. Well, even if you're teaching a new guy, right? Yeah. I mean, let's, let's face it. We've, we've, there was a, there was a firearms instructor when I was going through the police academy, you know, I'd just come out of the Marine Corps, you know, machine gunner schools and all, you know, I pretty extensive uh, background with firearms. And I think I know a couple of things about guns and, his pistol training for sure, as in is probably common, is superior to mine, right? But when I show up and I'm the young new guy listening, even though I really am new to that world, I'm new to that environment, I'm new to law enforcement, doesn't mean that I'm bringing nothing with me. And even the guys who are bringing no experience for the topic being taught, they're still bringing something with them too. Right. And what they're bringing with them is their emotional intelligence about what kind of person you are, whether or not they think that you're standing there to to make yourself feel better or superior to the student and your demonstration of of how you are you know, with whatever it is that you're good at or whatever it is that you're teaching. The guy in my academy class, he was so demeaning and derogatory to students that didn't know what they were doing that. I finally couldn't take it. I was a police recruit and I'm just like, Hey man, can you, can you like leave us alone? <laughs> like we're training over here and do our thing. Like, I, I don't really want to hear what you have to say. Um, and I was a lot younger and dumber at the time for speaking out of turn. So I felt confident in doing that, but most people wouldn't have, most people would have just been quiet, tuned the struct instructor out completely and learned nothing now that the period of instruction is effective effectively worthless or meaningless even with a new student as soon as they decide that you're not the type of person that they want to learn from you know what i mean yeah i, I it's funny you say that because at the police academy you know i was president of my class and there was this guy who'd been a college football player and he went back to the cafeteria because I think they gave us like one bologna sandwich, one bag of chips and some jungle juice. And he's like, hey, can I get another sandwich? And evidently the cafeteria work worker, the guy that owned the cafeteria, you know, he felt like he could talk to this guy like the instructors did. So it offended this big six foot eight former offensive lineman. And I'm like, hey, you can't talk to this guy like that, man. And then he started to go off of me. I'm like, okay, check this out. So right after that, I went to the students. I'm like, everybody saw what happened in the cafeteria, right? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, who wants your money back? Because uh, our departments had paid, like I say, $600 or $1,000 for us to eat in the cafeteria every day. And and I'm like, hey, man. So I, I had everybody sign a list. I went into the instructor cadre. I'm like, here you go. These, What is this? I'm like, these we want our money back. We're not eating there anymore. We're done. If they're going to be demeaning to, to us, it's not appropriate. And we'll take it from you. We're not taking it from them. And uh, they were like, oh, my God. And the next thing you know, the director of the school came down and apologized. And that guy was like, we started getting two sandwiches. <laughs> I'm serious, man. But uh, it's unacceptable. You know, uh, and there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And, you know, I didn't yell back at him. Just like, hey, I'm going to teach you a lesson, pal. Yeah. Uh, Rasmus says, Rich, how do you know each other? Uh, TJ and I trained together a few months back and, uh, I really enjoyed it. I, I want to ask you now, TJ, as a guy who spent almost your entire adult life in the profession of arms, but specifically law enforcement, what is the state of law enforcement today? Well, we're definitely in crisis right now. Um, nationally, I would even argue internationally, but especially nationally. Certainly in my agency, um, I have a lot of friends around the country in law enforcement and um, 
it does not appear to be a local problem. It appears to be a much bigger problem. And what it really is, is a crisis of leadership, I think, um, on many, many levels. But we have this, um, we have this sort of recurring cycle that happens, I think, in, in the world every 50 70 years we have these kind of moral convulsions um, that that seem to happen in society and i think we're right smack in the middle of one right now um the outcomes of those are not always the same i don't think i think that you have a community that doesn't trust its police. I think you have a police that doesn't trust its community, that doesn't trust its leaders, that doesn't trust its executives, that doesn't trust its councilmen or its mayors or its governors or its senators or its congressmen. I mean, there's there, while all of the things that have happened in the last two years have happened, a lot of people have been quietly watching and coming up with opinions about, um, the leaders. And I think that there has been a lot of folks who have exposed themselves. Um, and some of those uh, relationships or the trust and leadership is not salvageable at this point. It just is not. Um, the, the people who seem to truly care um, that are in leadership positions certainly don't seem to last long. They get ostracized at, at various levels of government. It's usually a political thing. Um, but the, the guys on the bottom watch all that happen and they're pretty quiet about it. Um, you know, the, the officers that work for me, they're not doing a lot of complaining anymore. They're not doing a lot of griping, but they're paying a lot of attention. Um, and but, you know, I, I think it's really important to 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 note here that the the decay of trust in America extends a lot further than the conversation between the police and the community. It, it, it's much more expansive than that. You know, the <clears throat> the measure of of moral quality in uh, society is always based on a social trust. Um, and right now there's there's little to none i mean we can't even figure out who to believe right now when we watch the news or go to social media or hear anything there is no trust so this moral convulsion that's kind of happening right now is largely i think related to a bigger type of distrust that we're going through as a nation um tribalism is is getting further and further away from the center on both sides um, and the further that we go, I think the further that society is going to decline, the further trust is going to decline. Um, and historically, and I'm talking world history across all of recorded history, that inevitably leads to collapse if it's not corrected. Um, you know, we, we act like we have a lot on the line now. But when this country was founded, there was a lot more on the line uh, than there is today. I mean, there are there are people in risk of losing their jobs right now for things that are political in nature. Um, and it's putting a lot of stress on police officers and first responders and firefighters and nurses and the people that we truly need to have in our society, not just cops. I mean, you got to think, be thinking much more further than that. The guy who picks up your trash in front of your house, the guy that makes sure that your water keeps running. We're in jeopardy of losing critical components of our society right now. Um, and it really has me worried. Um, but I, I do think that the, the visual loss of trust between the police and the community is really just a symptom of a much greater issue. Um, and it, it always comes to me, it always comes to a leadership issue. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with the, the collapse of, a, of American integrity and ideals. Um, and sort of the, the poisoning of, of American values that we were that we were raised on, you know, um, and the corruption of our leadership. We, 
<clears throat> we always either blame up the chain or down the chain, right? Like in, in anything that we do, um, you know, uh, a bad leader is going to say, well, it's not my fault. It's, it's his fault. You know, like we, we did everything we could, but there's, there's nothing I can do. We just, we just gotta, you know, go with it. Um, and that same guy pointing down, Hey, you know, like there's no, it was my guys. They are doing what they were doing. There's nothing I could do to stop them. Both of those things are a lie. <laughs> um, we don't, we don't trust our leaders. Our leaders have, have shown us that self-interest is, is, um, at the top of their agenda and whether you have extensive background in, in studying leadership philosophy or pr leadership principles or not just basic human intelligence tells us that somebody who's self-interested is not going to be a good leader and doesn't really care about us. And Jeff asked the question, you know, what do you see someone, what could someone do to rectify or mitigate these issues? Well, um, that's a really good question. Um, I think right now what is the most important um, is for us to not allow the continued, very, very slow decay of our core values and our principles that are slowly, slowly being stripped away from us. Um, on the on the bottom level, as far as what our expectations of our leaders are, because those are often understated as well. Of us, you know, we, we kind of feel like we can never tell the boss that he's doing a bad job. Hey, hey, sir, we need more out of you, right? This is unacceptable. Um, and people are terrified to do that, especially middle managers are terrified to do that because, uh, you know, everybody's proxying for position. But the way that I look at it, right, I have to I have to be able to go home and look my kids in the face. I have to be able to go home and, and lay down in my bed and sleep with a clear conscience. Um, I, I can't live a life where I pretend like things are okay when they're not or sweep things under the rug when they're not, when there's problems that be need to be addressed. It's like a, it's like a toxic relationship, toxic marriage, right? You, you have this bad relationship with this, this, you know, significant other. And at first things are good and little things start happening and you slide them under the rug because you care about each other and you don't want to make a big deal out of things. And then there's toxicity builds up, right? And then you still have opportunities to deal with it. And maybe you do, or maybe you don't, but if you don't, then they continue to be worse. And then you end up breaking up. And at a certain point, it's like, Hey, we're not going to be able to talk anymore. We're not going to, we can't be friends anymore. This is past repair. And it seems so simple to say, but the solution is pretty clear to me is like, you have to start saying something. You can't be quiet and say, well, it's not my problem or my rank is too low or it's not really it's not for me to be involved in. Or, you know what, I'm really afraid of getting terminated from my employer. I'm really afraid that somebody's going to, you know, find out and my my friends are going to, you know, turn their back on me. And my social standing or social status is going to be, you know, taken away from me. Um, and so we're really what we're doing right now is we're we're succumbing to fear. Um, and most of what's happening right now, and we talked about this last night is one giant game of chicken, right? Mm -hmm. Do what you're told, do what you're told, do what you're told. Like, Hey, we're going to make you do what you're told. And then it keeps escalating. And every time I say no, they double down, they double down, they double down, they double down. And it gets worse and worse and worse until finally it starts to be like, okay, there's real consequences coming right now. Real consequences. Um, for the decisions that I have to make. Um, the consequences in 1775 were like, hey, you're going to do what you're told or we're going to kill you, right? And throw you in the ocean. Um, at a certain point, people have to make a decision, right? Um, I don't care if somebody's left-leaning or right-leaning. I, I want common sense and... Um, 
and neighborly acts, right? That's really what it comes down to is how are you treating your neighbor? How are we treating each other? Are your leaders doing that? Are your leaders treating you appropriately? Are they treating you fairly? Are they treating your neighbors fairly? Is everybody getting a fair shot? Because those are the principles that were our country was founded on, right? Equality, the only real equality is mortality, okay? Like we're all born with the same shot. Not everybody ends up becoming the Olympic gold medalist though, because not everybody applies the same effort. There is no equality of effort, right? And we're not focusing on that right now. And what we need to be focusing on with our leaders and our and ourselves, right? We're equally as responsible. Everybody blames somebody for something, right? I blame people for, you know, specialty assignments that I've been removed from or, or positions that I used to be in and I'm not there anymore. And, you know, this guy screwed me over and that guy said this and that like everybody has someone that they're mad at for something that happened to them. Everyone, but really, right? we can we can break this down a lot bigger if you want baby boomers and gen xers have been you know complaining about millennials for a really long time and who made them who raised yeah. them yeah who's responsible for those people right you you bred life into those people and now they walk around on the planet and that it ain't our fault what they turned out it's your fault right if they're your kid they're your fault so i part of our problem across the board right now is is our moral fiber is coming unwoven um and those tears they start as little micro tears right and they're in noticeable and hey we're not going to make a big deal out of this one because it's, it's just this little thing and pick your battles um and it continues it's it's never usually just one big thing that everybody will unanimously argue with because that's not the way manipulation works manipulation works with grooming Manip manipulation works with a slow process of you know working people into submission well leadership isn't about submission yep. right that's that's called tyranny if i'm subservient to you and i have to do what you say because you told me that has nothing to do with freedom right and there's go find me a culture in history where that was the case, right? Against my will, I got to do what you say, but I have freedom. Like, no, that's not the way that it works. If I trust my leaders, I'm following you because I chose to, right? We need to start choosing who we're following right now. And if there's no good leader to follow, well, guess what? You all get to vote. We all get to vote. We need to pick some new leaders, right? Maybe we need to find some people that sit in the center and start thinking about, uh, stop thinking it's not my problem. Stop thinking there's nothing I can do to control this. Stop thinking it's not my place to say, it's not my place to stand up. I'm too small for this. Because the, what we're all doing right now, and it, it's, it's a tactic that works, is they feel people feel like they're on an island. They feel like they're by themselves, like they're hopeless. There's nothing that they can do. The government's too big. The authorities are too big. The powers are too big, right? And that's exactly what, across history, any tyrannical government has wanted for that people because that's the way that you control them, right? But when you have one voice can turn into a hundred voices, can turn into a thousand voices, and a thousand voices, you know, are powerful. People, you don't have to be an ass. You don't have to say, you know what, screw you. You don't believe my ideas and when we can't be friends and turn it off. Like it doesn't have to be that way. People need to start using their heads and, and stop being uh, emotional about something where the, the solution to this is very, very logical. No, no, I'm not going to do that. Yes, I'll do that because I agree with it. No, I'm not going to do that because I don't. Right. Um, but once you, I think once people realize that they have neighbors that feel the same way, they have family members that feel the same way, right? And you don't have to be confrontational with everybody about it. You just have to say, hey, listen, this is what I believe and this is what I'm going to do. 
And if you, my leader, aren't going to support that, then guess what? I'm going to go find a new leader. Yeah, I love it, man. I had a, um, I, I t- 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 we were talking about some of this last night. I, I told my wife, like, I'm working on becoming more ungovernable. <laughs> you know? And she's like, what? I'm like, yeah, man. Random acts of civil disobedience. And I did it as a Marine Corps officer. Once I went from being a gunny to being an officer. And I'm like, you know, if, if my if my hands are cold, I'm putting them in my pocket. Show me the Marine Corps order says I can't. Well, it's customs and courtesies. Well, good for you, man. I'm not violating any law and my hands are cold. Um, or walking across the grass. Well, we just don't do it. Yeah, well, you don't do it. I'm going to do it because we need to be able to th- think in ways that and break paradigms. So uh, as a way of explaining some of the things you're talking about, we had a uh, my last couple of years on Paris Island, for whatever reason, our uh, fire alarm kept going off. And the fire alarm would go off the first time it did, and we all filed out the back and uh, we're standing around on the street and Sergeant Major's like, Hey, we need to get off the street. So when the fire trucks come and I'm like, okay, that makes sense. So we get off the street and get in the grass. So he's like, so next time we all come out, gents, let's just go in the grass. Not a problem. Fire alarm goes off the next week. We all go to the grass and the sections start forming up. And then somebody got this idea like, well, there's a, there's a tennis court back here. Next time the fire alarm goes off, let's go to the tennis court. So the fire alarm goes off. We go out and everybody goes to the tennis court. Now the tennis court had a chain link fence around it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going in there. I'm like, why not? I'm like, cause I'm not some Pavlovian dog. You can ring a bell and I run inside the cage. You're going to lock. <laughs> you know, I've read Ellie Wessel's night. I've, I've read Victor Frankel's man's search of meaning. I understand what happens when, you condition us of people to do a certain thing. And I'm just not interested in being part of that. So Sergeant major, if you and the rest of the Marines want to go in there, knock yourself out, fist bump. I'm not going in there. And people can think that, well, you're overreacting. And I would say, you know, am I At some level, you have to draw a line somewhere and I will budge no further than this. And um, it doesn't have to be, no shots have to be fired. It's just, I'm not interested in where you're taking me, man. I'm not going to be a part of it. What do you think? Yeah, I think um, it's funny that you bring up Victor Frankel, right? The guy who, who was in a much worse situation than we we're in, right? Or that we've ever known. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've i read uh, most of Ryan Holiday's books. I've got his new book, actually, um, which I highly recommend. Um that uh, I'm only I'm not very far into it right now, but I'll already recommend it. Um, Ryan Holiday is uh, if if you don't know who he is, I'm sure that you do. Uh, I don't. No. Um, his his new book is man. I knew I was gonna have a a uh, it's like call, courage calling or calling courage or something like that. Um, I tried to pull it up on my eBooks right now, but it's going to shut down the screen. If I do, okay. so you can send it to me later, TJ, I'll put it in the show notes. I'll send it to you. But, uh, so Ryan holiday is basically like a modern, uh, philosopher of stoicism. That's what I would call him. They're like 21st century. He's not a military guy. He's just a regular guy. Mix, you know, kind of guys, uh, a lot of military guys connect with him um, and police guys connect with him, kind of like Simon Sinek, right? Right. Not a real background, but somebody that really seemed to identify with a lot of things that he says. And, um, you know, he does a lot of uh, like reading and translating, reflecting of Marcus Aurelius works and uh, Seneca and some of the older uh, Stoics. But yeah, life is either a, it can be a prison or a podium or a throne depending on what I decide my world is. Right. And, you know, not to, not to get, um, you know, I don't, I don't mean this like to get into like a religious conversation or anything like that, but you know, the guy, Paul and the Bible, he's the guys in prison writing like, these books and he seems like he's pretty happy about, you know what's going on you can go back and look on some places and some people in history that were going through some you know victor frankel's one of them some really poor things um that used those opportunities 
to become better people. Um, and part of what you just said is it, thinking is not enough. Thinking good thoughts is not enough. Having principles means nothing if you don't stand up for them. Having convictions means nothing if you're not willing to voice it. If you feel strongly about something, um, then how, how are you proving how strongly you feel about something if you, if you don't voice it uh, when you're instructed to do otherwise, right? Um, our, <laughs> our founding fathers basically created our, our entire society based off of the threat of violence, right? Mm -hmm. Like, Hey guys, um, you know, we, we are, by the way, creating this, this world where if this doesn't go right, uh, we're going to write some stuff down in here to where we can just do a hard reset if we need to. You know what I mean? There's some militant guys. Yeah. Um, I, you look back on what some of those guys said and some of the one liners. I mean, like Ben Franklin, I think it was in, you know, 1759, maybe 1760. You know, those who would give up a little bit of essential liberty to purchase temporary safety deserve neither temp you know, safety or liberty. Like that's a pretty hardcore thing to say. You know, that might be his translation from way back then. And, you know, they used a little, a different type of English than we use now, but you're talking about guys who were ready to kill people over what they believed and did kill people. And they did. They <laughs> yeah. killed a lot of people over what they believed. Um, and I'm not saying go out and kill people. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is, your convictions don't mean anything if you don't stand up for them. Um, and it's easy to say that in theory, but when it comes down to practice, like in the Marine Corps, you do that to a senior officer. There are, there are consequences sometimes oh, yeah. standing up for your convictions. It's not free. No. Sometimes it means you're going to get in trouble. Sometimes it means you're going to get reprimanded. Sometimes it might, might mean that you're going to lose a job opportunity or a promotion. Sometimes it might mean you're going to get fired and have to go do something else. But are your convictions and core values really yours if you don't own them? Uh, are, if a little bit of adversity takes those away from you, you are they send you about yourself. You know, and I think that's not just for me, that's for everybody. Like part of what's going on right now is people need to do some self-reflection on what they really believe. Um, and if they do believe the things that they say um, and a little bit of consequence takes away their willingness to stand up for those things, then how much do you really believe in it? Because I'll tell you right now, like, I'll, like let me give you like a no brainer of something I believe in. I believe very strongly that if somebody were to come into my house and, and with bad intentions towards my family, right? Somebody came in here looking to do harm to my daughter. I feel pretty strongly about the way that that would end. I have a lot of conviction about the consequences of somebody doing that to me. Right. And it's easier to digest and understand when you break it down of like somebody's coming in unwarranted, and trying to change something about the way that you live or change something about how happy you can, you know, how your quality of life or the way that you live. But nobody's kicking our doors down right now, right? They're not. Mm -hmm. um, it's happening in a different way. But is it really different? Are they changing what might the world that my daughter's going to grow up in? Yeah, they are. And I feel strongly about that. I want her to grow up in a good world where she has opportunities like I had, where she can go out and work and grow and learn and be fulfilled. Right. And I don't want a world for her where she doesn't have the freedom to make her own choices. Right. Where she, where she, uh, she doesn't have the opportunity to earn her way and to, and to become something. Right. Again, like I said, if everybody's equal, then, what's the point of becoming a doctor, right? Yeah. What's, what's, the, what's the point of becoming an astronaut if we're all the same? We're not all the same, right? Equality starts at birth and it ends at death. Those are the two times that we're all equal. There's a 100% mortality rate in this life, right? That's, that's the equalizer. 
Everything that happens in between those two things is where we separate ourselves. For me, my conviction of if I am truly to say that I'm a leader of my family, I'm a leader in my organization, I'm a leader over my men or the women that work for me, um, and that I care about them and what happens to them, I have to stop thinking so right now about the way things are working. And I need to start thinking about the long term, about how things are going to pan out if somebody doesn't say something. Yeah, you know, uh, a, a goal without action is just a dream. You know, you you can have the greatest conviction in the world, but if you sit there with your on your hands, it, it means absolutely nothing. And like you said, I have refused two different orders, and I can tell you that uh, when you refuse an order, you stand by. And I remember the first one was as a, a special operations officer with the sheriff's department. And as soon as I did, it was like, okay, you need to sit down and write a statement. I'm like, not a problem. And I heard the the sheriff's helo flying in, and uh, he wanted to get in front of this young officer who was telling people, not going to do it. And thankfully, I had my ducks in a row uh, and didn't get shot in the face. And the, the corporal and sergeant who was trying to get me to do this immoral, unlawful act were the ones that were held accountable. Sure. But you better be you better be ready because don't think people are going to stand up and applause when you tell them to pound sand. It's probably not going to happen. Uh, but again, I can look my kids in the eye. I can look my family in the eye and, and my more importantly, maybe myself and say, well, I, I didn't I'm not going to do that. And uh, if, if that means walking away from a good opportunity, then that's sometimes what you have to do uh, if you really believe what you believe. Yeah. The, uh, the first time I ever got disciplined as a supervisor was, uh, you know, there was a, there was an officer who he didn't work for me, but, um, he was getting, he was getting looked at for, um, some mistakes that he had made. One of those mistakes was something that I was present for. Um, and I say mistakes that he had made. The one that I was present for still, I would argue that the officer did nothing not wrong. He was doing good police work, right? Um, we don't control uh, bad guys' decisions, right? Outcomes are, are not 100% up to our vote and our decision-making process. Somebody else gets a vote in the conclusion as well. And um, But there was, you know, it wasn't even that there was a terrible conclusion. It was just that uh, some of the things that he did got brought into question because of some other things that were going on with him in his career. Um, and I got pulled in and got this, you know, kind of talking to him, like, Hey, TJ, you're, you're doing great, man. And, you know, we think that we think that you're a, a good sergeant and, you know, here's the thing, like this, this officer, you know, he's, he's strapped to the train tracks, TJ. And, uh, you know, you standing in front of him is not going to help keep him from getting run over. Like he's going to get hit by the train, regardless of what you do. And, uh, you just need to get out of the way. Um, and I went home that night and I, after I had this talking to, I couldn't sleep. I was staring at the ceiling and I, I knew I had to go in for this uh, interview the next day to talk about it again. And I was so conflicted about it because it, it was going to mean, you know, discipline for me and transfer opportunities and, and things. And I <laughs> really, had, you know, getting eaten up by this. And finally, I, you know, I told you my grandfather was from, you know, fought in Korea. And uh, when I was a, when I was a kid and I was going through something hard, I had kind of a rough childhood. Um, he would always say, consider it pure joy, boy, uh, to me. Like, you know, when, when I'm going through something bad, like good for you, man, I'm glad that you're, I'm glad that you're going through this. I'm glad that you're great, you know, earning those calluses and growing and learning and, be and becoming something with a little bit more, um, you know, uh, grit or forbearance or steadfast, you know, ness in your, in your heart than you had before. Right. And I started thinking about him and, uh, what he would have said to this situation. I just felt all of a sudden it was better. Right. I went to sleep, slept like a baby. I think I slept like nine hours that night, which I never do. Um, 
woke up the next morning, had a good breakfast, drive downtown for this interview. And I'm sitting in this room with all these executives and all these people. And um, I basically said like, hey, you know, um, I understand you guys are saying this officer did something wrong, but it's my opinion that anything he would have been done wrong, do, doing wrong, he did right in front of me, knowing and trusting that I would have stopped him if I thought his actions were inappropriate. He's got a year and a half on. I've been you know, doing this job for over a decade, and, and this officer relies on me to tell him when he's making mistakes or, or to discontinue what he's doing, and I didn't. And now I didn't do that because I didn't think he was doing anything wrong. If you're saying that he did, okay, cool. But you can't be mad at him about it when I stood there as his leader and watched it happen. Yeah. You got to be mad at me. And oh, they were so mad at me, Rich. They were so <laughs> mad at me. But I have that reprimand framed on my desk. Um, uh, and I, I didn't frame it at first. Um, that officer came and talked to me about a year later. Um, and we had a, a private conversation that I'm not going to share with you about what it meant to him that I stood mm -hmm. up him. Um, and it, it was one of those, um, I, I wouldn't trade the learning experience of that for anything, um, of, of realizing that the acceptance of so seeing something wrong happening in front of me in the name of self-preservation is not something that I wanted to live with. Um, and how, uh, how much better my, um, confidence as a leader, my reputation as a leader, my, uh, relationships with my people, the trust that my officers had with me after that happened. And those were all unforeseen, you know, I didn't realize or consider any of those things as it was going to happen or realize the kind of ripple effect that was going to come out when people started talking about how that played out. Um, but my point is, is that it always, the, the easy answer, um, doesn't mean it's the, the right answer long term and it's not necessarily the answer that you want to live with. Um, it's not necessarily the answer that you would be proud to tell your kids about what you did. It's not necessarily the answer that um, you can, you know, be old and dying and laying in your bed and thinking, man, I sure did that one right. You know, I did, sure did that one wrong and be okay with the decisions that you've made in your life and having a clear mm -hmm. conscience, you know, like, I've come to this, I have this thought process in almost everything now that I can have, I can choose growth or I can choose comfort. Yeah. Um, and they're not synonymous with one another. Uh, the, the most expensive salt that I've ever bought came off of my forehead. It didn't come from something that I, you know, purchased. It came from something that I had to sweat for and earn. Uh -huh. um, and all of the greatest things are the things that I'm most proud of, the, the, um, the best relationships that I have, the, the loyalties that I have to other people, they all came out of tumultuous times. They all came out of hard decisions. They all came out of the possibility of consequences that I didn't want to have to take on, you know, and I haven't. always problems that we have they it's not that they're not fixable it's that people are afraid of the consequences we are we're afraid officers are afraid firefighters are afraid nurses are afraid people around with and living with right now see That's prevent. I'm not going to do that. I don't, I don't believe in that. I don't care. Whatever it is. You know what I mean? It's not even about believing or not believing in any specific thing. It's just not being willing to participate in things that you don't agree with. Right. Or behaviors yep. that you don't agree with. So that's my thought on that. I came up.
Yeah, man. I came up on, you, you, you referenced Marcus Aurelius and those of you watching, if you haven't read Meditations, do yourself a favor and, and check that out. And there's some other great uh, Seneca and Epictetus. And, but I came to Stoic philosophy, I don't know, maybe 17 years ago, reading the Warrior Triad, which is a series of lectures that Admiral James Stockdale gave, uh, I believe, to the Naval Academy. And uh, James Stockdale, for those of you who don't recognize the name, he won the Medal of Honor for his for being a POW. He was the senior man at the Hanoi Hilton. And one of the things that he won the Medal of Honor for was, you know, when he, they would try to get him to do or say stuff to his uh, prisoners that he was in command of at the Hanoi Hilton, and he wouldn't do it. So they would torture him, and he was fine with that. You know, he's like, hey, this is my lot in life. And I'm going to take broken bones and I will not do what I don't want to do. And he's like, I will not hold my captors responsible. I will either make the decision to do it or not do it. I love that. So it comes time to, they take him in this room and they say, you know, uh, Captain Stockdale, you are going to go on air and you're going to say what, you know, the criminal regime in America has done, blah, 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 blah. And, of course, he's giving him the normal line, like, no, I'm not going to do it. I could. Okay, we're going to kill this guy if you don't. One of his uh, prisoners, fellow prisoners. So he's going to die because of your decision. So he's like, can I think about it? And they're like, yeah, sure. Like, can I get a glass of water? So he's sitting there trembling, sipping on the glass of water, and he says, what does Stoic philosophy say I should do? I mean, if I say no, I'm going to cause the death of this uh guy who had nothing to do with it. So you know what he did? Do you know this story? No. He smashes the glass, takes the broken end of it, and just cuts his face to ribbons so that they could not put him on television. And he could still honor his commitment to not – and they never tried it again, by the way. He said after he did that, they're like, hey, man, this guy's <laughs> – he's crazy. you know. And he just literally – jagged his face to pieces so that he could not be put on television and that airman would not be killed. Um, so how, again, how strong are your convictions? And, and Admiral Stockdale is a hero of mine, but it, it started with, and as he talks about in the, in the warrior triad, it started with him learning about stoic philosophy as a guy in college. And then just, he saw an opportunity to put it into practice. Yeah. I mean, it, if if your thoughts don't match your behaviors then um then they're just thoughts they're not they're not convictions uh you got to have a real conviction to chop your face off over another person that's not you can't fake that you can't you can't fake that kind of love mm -hmm. um and you know a lot of people think that that wars are won by um, you know, duty to country and duty to, you know, leadership and chain of command and protecting the homeland. And you and I both know that it is, it's about camaraderie. It's about esprit de corps. It's about loving your brothers that you're fighting with. That's every, every great general knows that the way to win a war is about that long game of men who love each other getting trenched in together. Um, and it's, that's one of the deepest types of conviction I think that I've seen um, in in my life. You know, where um, people who are willing to die for it, it's 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 one thing to be willing to die for a, a friend of yours. It's it's one to be one thing, or I'm sorry, to to die for a a family member or a friend. It's another thing to die for somebody that's not your blood or somebody that you don't know or somebody that you don't owe something to. Um, you know, if, if uh, greater love hath no man than someone that would die for his friend, what does that say that about somebody that would die for a stranger? Right. Yeah. Um, the, the military men and women and officers that I have known and their camaraderie and love towards one another, you know, I, I, my partner that I had in, in, uh, as an officer in patrol when I was a, a young B cop, um, you know, we rode together in a car for years and years together. Probably, I, I probably spent eight years of my life, 40 hours a week in a car with this guy um, through Christmases and Thanksgivings and my birthday and anniversaries and every 
great and terrible thing you can imagine, right? We pulled dead babies out of swimming pools together and we participated in saving and taking life together. And, it, and you cannot put a value on that type of love that, that people have for one another. And I, I don't believe in a thin blue line anymore. I don't think that it exists. I don't think that, uh, I, I, I think the only way to make everybody love you as a law enforcement officer right now is that you got to die and you got to die violently. Um, because everything else, <laughs> uh, you're subjected to all types of scrutinies, right? You mean you but, can't do a TikTok video and everybody's going to love you? Do dance no, you sure can't. You can try it. You might be able to get a bunch of people to follow you, but that has nothing to do with police work. No. Right. Um, but I can tell you that um, there's nothing that I would not do for that man that I spent all those years in that car with now, nothing. Um, and it's, it's something that people who haven't done it don't understand. They don't understand those loyalties. They don't understand that type of camaraderie. I think, uh, Marines understand it very well. I, I, I have never really been in a culture that was more, um, charismatic in that type of camaraderie than the Marine Corps. But I think policemen right now, that the only thing that they're hanging on to, and it scares the life out of me, but it also gives me hope, is they're hanging on for each other. They don't want to do this job no more. They don't feel loved by their communities. They don't feel loved by their governments. They don't feel loved by their chain of commands. But damn it, they do not want to let each other down. Um, and I think as long as that exists, just like it did in, in World War II and every other great campaign that our country has fought and won, that the reason those men kept fighting oftentimes had nothing to do with any of those other mitigators. You're not, you know, it, sorry, ladies, your, your husbands aren't thinking about you in war. They're thinking about their brothers. And that's how those wars are won. Um, and right now, um, on the streets in our in our country, we are at war, in a way. And those officers that are trying to toe the line, God bless them, man. Um, they're good people. Um, and I'll get I'll get a little emotional allergies um, if I if I talk about that too much. But you know they they're going through a lot right now. Um, yeah, they are. And um, watching them love each other anyways, and, and me knowing because I've been through it that that's the reason why they're still there, um, it's pretty powerful. So uh, what those guys need, though, right now is they need, uh, they need the people around them to start voicing their convictions, right? And they need everybody to be a part of the tribe. That's what they need. Um, you know, you don't you don't get to to be a, a non participant in a time of war in your homeland. Everybody has to part. Everybody has to participate, right? Everybody needs a role. Um, and these guys, I have seen the most selfless acts that that I can imagine of these guys taking care of each other and taking care of people on the street and doing things that are unheard of that nobody ever hears about. Yeah. They don't ever tell, we don't ever forward those ones up to the police chief and say, Hey, Hey boss, look what Johnny did. He's such a great guy. Nobody hears about those because we keep them sacred. We don't want people to know, right? The most intimate relationships with people, the, the people who I have saved the lives that I know that I've changed, right? I had a, a gal try to, exploit an incident that I was on and try to make it a big publicity deal. And I about lost my mind. Like, like, what are you trying to like take? These are, these are moments are precious to me, right? None of your business. That's not why I'm here. I'm not here to get on TV and get on the news and get famous. I'm here because I believe in what it is that I'm doing mm -hmm. and, and helping these people that need help. My, my brother and my sister, the youngest brother and sister that I have are adopted. Um, and they came from like, man, you want to talk about having it rough, just the most horrible conditions that you can imagine, like sexually exploited at very, very young ages, like three and five, they're getting raped and, you know, 
the, the most horrible things that you can imagine, right? My kid brother's getting hospitalized when he's a baby, you know, and stabbed with scissors and terrible things. So my, you know, my mom's an angel. She, she scoops these two kids up and brings them into their house and they're damaged. You want to talk about kids that are damaged. These kids are damaged. Um, and they've had, in spite of the fact that they got rescued, they had really hard lives because of things that happened to them when they were three years old. And I remember their, uh, well, the brother rather, my brother's biological dad coming over to my parents' house. And I was probably about, so he was three, I think I was maybe like 15. Um, and I just remember this feeling inside of me, like I wanted to tool this dude up. I was so pissed. Um, because I had kind of started hearing about the stories and stuff, and I knew he was responsible. Uh, but um, that's a, a huge reason of the, you know, part of the reason why I became a police officer is I started to have this this anti bully sentiment of like, man, who are these guys that go out and prey on these people that can't defend themselves? Right. I'm a strong dude. Yeah. Like I want to go out and, but you, you want to bully people like, okay, well let's, we can, we can do that. And that's where my heart is at. Okay, cool, man. Like you want to be a bad guy. I got an answer for that. Um, and I've dedicated my life. Um, and my body is broken, right? I, I can't even tell you how many injuries and surgeries and broken bones and concussions and things that I've had in, in my career. And I don't care about any of it. I care about whether or not I get to die and say, you know what? I'm not a perfect man. I made a lot of mistakes. Um, but I think I, I made a good example for my kids about how a good man acts. And I think that I did the, the neighborly acts in my life to take care of my community um, and to, to be the barrier between those type of people and the people that I love, you know? What I would say to the police officers right now that are listening to this, who are discouraged and who feel like they're not cared about, um, and I, I empathize with you and I understand, but I would say to you, when you go to the call, that if your mindset right now is I'm just going to do the bare minimum, I'm just going to answer the radios, I'm going to lay low, I got to let this, you know, this, uh, wave pass through and I got to just kind of cruise and weather the storm. I get it. Um, but what type of police officer do you expect to show up at your mom's house when she calls 911 for help? Uh -huh. um, Cause you still got to be that guy. Um, and I know it's hard because sometimes the consequences of being the guy that you would expect to show up at your mom's house when she needs help means that you're going to bring a lot of violence with you and it might not look good. But it doesn't mean that it's the wrong thing. Um, that's why we have discipline. That's why we train, right? If if you're if you're not capable of violence at the moment of truth, you will be a failure. All of the effort, energy, your department is used to train you and equip you and transport you, just wasted. And and you'll die like a dog, or your friends will die like a dog, or somebody will die, and it will be your fault. And worse than that, you'll have failed everybody who depends on you. But if you're capable of violence and you have no discipline, you're the worst of the worst. That's the monsters, right? They're a danger, a threat to our 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 entire civilization, our way of existence. So, you know, that's a lot of what my company is based on. Like violence is your duty right discipline is where your honor comes from have your discipline continue to discipline yourselves recognize that what's right is not always what's popular right have some have some purpose some virtue some inside of you something that you can go to sleep on whether you get in trouble or not and believe that you behaved and performed with nobility that's what more than you know what people need from you right now um, all of that stuff gets lost in translation. Uh, but the easiest way to, to, to keep it in focus is all right. Like I'm going to, I'm going to this call. It's a domestic violence or it's a, a trespasser or it's a burglary or whatever the heck it is. I'm going to an alarm call. Um, 
when you show up, that person that you're talking to is somebody's mom. Um, uh-huh. It could be, you, you never know. You never know who that person is that you're going to talk to. Years ago, uh, my mom, actually, she lives in the city that I work in and her house got burglarized her car rather got burglarized and a, a bunch of equipment got taken out of her car and her neighbor saw it go down. So, she, you know, he goes out and chases these kids down the street and catches them and uh, calls the police. Officers come out. Bad guys are in custody. Everything's good. Um, and there's, you know, hundreds of pounds worth of stuff that these kids walked off with and it's a block away sitting on the sidewalk down the street and you know my mom's an old lady and she's uh you know frail like she's not going to be carrying 100 pounds of stuff back to her house for a quarter of a mile and so she asks these officers you know hey you mind helping me get my stuff home um and they told her no that's not our problem ma'am we're here we're here to do our you know regular work and we're going to get this take this bad guy and book him for you and good luck getting your stuff back to your house and she calls me and she's not a complainer but she's telling me this story and i feel like my head's gonna pop off right i'm pissed i'm fuming mad i'm already sending text messages trying to figure out who these officers were that took disposition of this call at her house like man i'm gonna have words with these boys but my point in saying that is is that like what do you expect of officers like be what you expect of officers as an officer, you, you be your own leader, right? Have some conviction in what you're doing, show up and act the way that you would expect you to act. If you were the one who called police or your wife was the one who called police or your mom was the one who called the police, right? Do those things. And whether or not people like what you did or not, you can still be righteous in your actions and your behaviors. If you, if you take that philosophy into the type of work that you do right so yeah i want to get to some of the comments here that that have come in since you were talking uh will says by changing nothing nothing changes that's a quote from tony robbins robert says love this uh we also have integrity and honor ryan says i live by quote your actions are so loud i can't hear a word you're saying yeah totally love that Doug says, I wish I didn't have to go to work. This is an important conversation. And I'm going to leave a lot of meat on the table today. Uh, Things that I wanted to talk with you about, but we're just not going to have time because I want to get to these last few things because I think they're much more important than some of the other things that we were going to talk about. But I'd I'd like to get you back on, TJ, if you're up for it, because I do want to talk to you about some of the things that we did not cover today. But one of the things I want to talk to you about is, man, looking into your crystal ball as far as, before I finish that thought, several, uh, quite a while ago, you know, you talked about we're going through rough times and and uh, there's a book that's called uh, The Storm Before the Calm. And I can't remember the author's name, but it, it kind of talks about from the founding fathers all the way to today and how these things work in cycles, which is what you're talking about. And he says, you know, we currently find ourselves in one of these very tumultuous cycles, but we'll come out of it. But it may take four to eight years to do it. So in saying that timeline, four to eight years, man, where do you see uh, our nation headed in the near term, 2022 to 2024, let's say? Uh, Well, I would say the and that's a great question, Rich. I I appreciate you asking it. we there's there's a path out right um but it's the hard path out and people got to decide what path they want to take um there's there's often two roads there's always two options like i said earlier you can have growth or you can have comfort right um very very rarely are the things that are most meaningful or the most impactful in life the things that are the easiest to come by so um, I would say that it, it comes down to choice, right? Because it, it hidden away in the genesis of every hardship, every misfortune, every tribulation or affliction or loss, prosperity, fortune, gain, success, 
victory. There's a predisposition there of choice. Um, they're not easy. They're going to bear fruit of some kind. Uh, it's always, it's a byproduct of a decision, right? Um, it can be poisonous. It can be nourishing. Um, it can have no value whatsoever. Um, and it really depends on the matter in which that cult choice was cultivated. Um, but I want to be really clear about something and that the choice is not an option of to whether or not the circumstance itself is going to come into existence because the circumstance is coming with or without your permission. It's coming with or without your approval. The path is going to be there regardless. It, you cannot have control over the decisions of others. You can't control external forces or nature. Um, so if nothing can be con done to control those surroundings, then the only thing that remains is your response to the circumstance and the choices that you made. And, and I would say, by the way, that that is um, the basic element of stoicism in and of itself. Um, so, um, you know, one of the, one of the things with my company that we, you know, talk about a lot is embracing the arena. Right. And so you picture the, the Roman, uh, Coliseum and I don't know how well versed you are with the history of the Coliseum or how it, um, you know, things were organized there. I had the opportunity to go there a couple of years ago with my wife and I actually have a, um, piece of the travertine from the gladiator entrance of the, the Coliseum. Um, yeah, I was there in 2019, man. Yeah. Um, you, you, you go and you look at this big gate, um, that they walked into the gladiators walked into, and, you know, you got to keep in mind, a lot of those gladiators were slaves. A lot of those gladiators were prisoners. They were convicts. They weren't, uh, they were not the rich and powerful. They weren't the heroes of the society. Um, but the ones who became free were the ones that entered the Coliseum by choice. They were the ones who embraced the suck willingly, right? This is going to happen. I'm going to get knocked down or whatever it is. Nobody, a, a year after whatever hardship you've endured, nobody's going to remember what the hardship itself was. What they're going to remember is the way that you handled it, the way that you responded to it, right? When and after it happened. Um, you... Your path to self-improving is about mindset and it's about making the decision, right, to enter the arena by choice, right? A, a good captain is not the product of the calm sea. The best navigators, the best, you know, operators, I hate that word, but the best operators that I know, the best men that I know have been through horrible, horrible things, right? And they're cool as a cucumber because they know what real, real bad looks like. Um, and that's how you develop perseverance and that and temperance. Um, that's, that's how you prepare yourself for bigger tests that are coming down the road. And I have a feeling that we have some bigger tests um, coming in the next, like you said, 2024. I, I don't think that the next three years is going to be a walk in the park for us as a nation or as a profession. Uh, I, I, I think it's going to be challenging. Um, seek out to navigate the smaller storms, right? Take, start taking your stances now, be a person of conviction so that when the bigger fights come, you're ready for them. Um, and I think that if our, we, with our so many good and, you know, honest people in our country I, I think if I, whether you're right leaning or left leaning everybody I think can agree with doing the right thing for the most part we there is a center that can be found right it, it's not going to be obtained in an easy conversation um, but without disciplining ourselves first and recognizing that we are responsible for the failures that are happening and then taking it upon ourselves 
to be a part of the solution and do something useful. Stop complaining. Stop crying about the way things are. Stop acting as though we're being oppressed. If you're being oppressed, you're allowing yourself to be oppressed, right? At a certain point, you have to make a choice. Um, what we need to do is take responsibility for what we believe in, whether what, I don't care what you believe in, but whatever it is that you believe in, you need to start standing up for it. You need to start uh, taking responsibility for the destiny of your own future and the future of your kids and your families and recognize that if this fails, you are partly at fault. Um, and I don't want it to fail. I love this country. I love this nation. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a patriot. Um, I, I believe in the principles that this country was founded on. Um, and I want my kids to be able to grow up in that America. Um, so, you know, I burying enough of my friends and, and seeing enough innocent people that got hurt, um, drove this, um, feeling in me, you know, a long time ago. Um, especially when I started going and burying buddies of mine that were getting killed at work, you know, and, or that they were killing themselves, you know, yeah. half the time, um, that we're running out of time, right? I have this feeling and it's growing on me and it's getting more intense as time goes on. Like we are running out of time to make a decision. We're running out of time to prepare ourselves. We are running out of time to change the direction that this ship is going um, before we crash into the rocks. So, but we have time. Um, people just need to realize uh, it can't just be the captain running the ship. You can blame everything on the captain. And at the end of the day, guess what? It's the captain's fault that the ship goes down. But everybody on that ship plays a role and everybody needs to start doing their part. If you're afraid of of losing, if you're afraid of the, the financial stability of your family moving forward for the decisions that you have to make, if they're based on conviction um, and you're willing to sacrifice a little bit of essential or a little bit of temporary safety, because that's what it is. It's not permanent. It's temporary safety. Um, then you're denying your family those liberties down the road, and they'll be taken from you much easier then, I promise you. So everyone owes everyone everything right now. If we believe what we say we believe, then I am, would say that I owe you, Rich. I owe you a good America and you owe me a good America. Uh -huh. um, and if we don't start becoming neighborly with one another and communicating with one another about how we're going to grow together and go in the right direction together, albeit hard, it will be rewarding. Then it will be, it will be great or it will be terrible. But right now we're at a crossroads. Um, so my my magic eight ball right now says i believe that uh, people will make the right decision to go down the right road um, but i'm a stoic so i don't control what other people do all i do is control what i do and and try the best i can to act out what i believe in a way that's authentic in a way that i can go home and sleep with a clear conscience with so um very long answer to a short question but um, that's a great answer, man. And Jared says, by far the most inspirational speaking I've heard in a while. Yeah. And, Appreciate that, Jared. Yeah. And, and he's, he's right. And, I, you know, people have said, aren't you worried, Rich? You know, you've got this show and, you know, you could get canceled. I'm like, you're only canceled if you allow it to happen. I'm not going to apologize to the mob for anything. You know, yeah. I'm just not. Um, I'm going to come on here and invite people that I love and respect like you and, and uh, everybody's like, man, you got the great guests. I said, most of these people are people that that I know and they're part of my circle. I love and respect them. And I just want them to to say what's on their heart. And, and people can either hear it or reject it. But uh, right now we need people saying the things that people may not want to hear uh, because I think they're incredibly important. And we're either going to 
win or succeed by by the decisions that we have to make here in the coming days, weeks, months, and years. If we don't, we're going to have a bifurcated America. I mean, hell, we already have one right now. And where does this bifurcation go? Well, it goes into a, some sort of balkanization. And if, if I, that's not necessarily the country I want to live in where we're torn into giant chunks. And uh, But at the same time, you know, there has to be a line in the sand. Some of my ancestors fought at the Battle of Kings Mountain, as my wife did, too. And when I got into genealogy and, you know, you had uh, this British officer, Major Ferguson, that said, I'm going to come over the, the mountain there in uh, East Tennessee and I'm going to lay waste to your your communities with fire and sword. And those those guys had a decision to make. They can lay down their arms because that's what this British officer was requiring them to do. Lay down your weapons and I won't lay waste to your community with fire and sword. And they're like, no, not going to happen. And and they joined together and, and uh, killed him at the Battle of Kings Mountain and, and drove the British back to the sea. And these were not soldiers, man. These were just average farmers but they knew you cannot take my rifle away man i live on the frontier i'm under constant threat of the indians i need this rifle to hunt deer i need this rifle for self-defense i'm not giving it up yeah and the minute that you do i mean look at what's going on in australia i mean a, a year and a half ago this was a free first world country and now that they've given their weapons they're just living in tyranny it's what's happening in australia should scare everybody right now that's exactly right. Uh, last question I have for you, TJ, uh, on round one, which is what this is. You know, you've been involved in thousands of use of force incidents. And what can the average person watching or listening to today's show do to make themselves harder to kill? Uh, take all the pain on the front end. That's what I would say, is that uh, comfort is a very slow death. It's easy to work a 10 hour shift and feel tired and go home and drink a beer and go to sleep and wake up the same thing every day. Or if you're just a, you don't even have to be a cop, right? We go out, we work home, we come home and we want our amenities. And that's, that's one of the ways they've made us fat and sloppy um, is they just give us everything we want and we just take it and we're, we're happy with it. But comfort is a slow death. I think if you choose your pain up front, right? Go do jujitsu. Go um, defeat yourself first. Um, then when you have the challenges, I mean, the, the, the hard part's already done. You don't want to figure out what you're made of when you're in a fight for your life. Um, that's, that's the wrong time to discover that you're ill-prepared, right? The right time to discover is, you know, right now is look go find a brazilian jiu-jitsu gym in your area and sign up and go go let another human being you know push you and choke you and you know strangle you with your own shirt and see how you stand up to that um, when you're doing it on a mat that nobody nothing really bad is going to happen to you and it's going to stop as soon as you say stop anyways practice it there when it's sterile uh, before you have to try it on asphalt against somebody that's not going to stop when you tap your arm on their shoulder. Um, if you don't own a gun and you don't train with a firearm, I would say that uh, you're silly, but I'm a little bit militant in that sense of the of thinking. Not everybody agrees with me, but um, if it's for no other reason than to protect and defend your family, you know, if you're a pacifist, okay, that's cool. You don't want to defend yourself. I understand that. But if you're going to be defending your family, I don't know a pacifist that says they wouldn't engage in violence to help their family, right? So buy a gun, train with it. Um, be very careful about the instructors that you choose to teach you. Seek out a reputable source, please, because you can get hurt or learn the wrong things or do very stupid things. But if you have the right mentors and coaches, whether it be uh, jujitsu or shooting or anything like that, the mentorships, like put yourself into voluntary apprenticeships, right? Seek people who are better than you at the things that you wish to achieve and help them to, to pull you as they continue to climb. And I would say, by the way, as you start climbing, look down back behind you for somebody else that needs to get pulled up behind you. Yeah. Um, because one of the hardest ways to be killed is when you've got a whole tribe of people that are standing behind you 
So defeat yourself, um, have a tribe, uh, discipline yourself now. Um, so that everything is easy. Everything is easy on the back end if you take the pain on the front end, but the pain's coming either way. Yeah. I want to unpack just a few of those things while I still got you on here. And that is, I had this, one of my guiding philosophies is I'm always trying to take care of the future me, the future Rich Brown. Um, you know, like that guy is always set up for success. I've teed that guy up good, whether it's a, by getting good sleep or by hitting the mats hard or by taking the pain and retiring after 20 years in the Marine Corps or whatever it is, I'm always trying to set my future self up for success. And one of the ways I do that is, like you said, uh, these comfort-based decisions. I'm telling you, man, in the Marine Corps, the biggest slam you could give a fellow officer was to say, you know, Sam over there, he makes comfort-based decisions. And I'm like, whoa, you know, that tells you everything you need to know about Sam. Like, whoa. He won't take the pain right now. You know, he's, he's one of those guys. And the final thing is this idea of pacifism. I just don't buy it. And uh, I've often wanted to meet a real pacifist and, and do this little thought experiment. As soon as, as soon as he says, you know, every time I'm a pacifist, Hey man, brother, I appreciate that. And slap the living shit out of that guy as hard as I can. And then as soon as he, I'm like, hey, man, remember, I'm so sorry. Remember, you're a pacifist. It would do nothing to use violence against me, right? Yeah, you're right. Okay, sorry, bro. And then slap him again as hard as I could. And eventually, guess what's going to happen? Or I slap his wife right in front of him. And again, it's like, oh, that sounds really cruel, not bro. I'm helping this guy. Sometimes that's what help looks like, you yeah. know, because it's it's unacceptable to walk around in, in the current day we live in with that kind of attitude. I'm not going to be involved. I'm going to sit on the sideline. I'm a pacifist. Well, we don't need you right now. You're not helping us. Yeah, it's just a rejection of personal responsibility, in my opinion. I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I love the irony when they call the police, though. I know. Yeah, that's uh, That was one of those things, like with this, uh, the Kyle Rittenhouse thing, which we could we could spend two hours talking about, but. As soon as he the, the the first shot goes off for him to to defend himself, people are like, get the police down here, get the police. Like, wait a minute, you were just rioting and and throwing bottles and rocks at these people. Now suddenly, somebody's defending themselves, and you want the cops. Yeah, it's the irony there. So, uh, last thing, TJ, um, tell us about your company, HVL, and where can people find you, man? Uh, so, uh, hopefully, next time I come on, I'll have a better um uh directions for you we have i got a tech guy right now that's re he's uh we hired a guy who's building a new uh like web platform for us that we can't get delisted from <laughs> so youtube and instagram and facebook and all those entities they're not uh hyper keen on uh uh firearms or firearms training or second amendment type things so uh, HVL Arizona is the um, username on our Instagram. That's the only social media account that we have. Um, our posts get deleted off there, and we we pretty much numbed it down to just uh, some things that you can go look at that are cool. You can always message us on there if you want to get a hold of me. Um, shoot me a message on Instagram, and I'll reply to you. Um, if you want to buy something or, or anything like that, be careful about the verbiage that you use on Instagram. If you don't think that they read your messages, they do just, uh, best thing, actually, if you want to buy a gun or you're looking at an NFA item, or you have a question about training or firearms or something related to that. Um, and you're going to message us on Instagram, just shoot me your email. Hey man, I'd like to talk to you about this or like talk about that. I'll reach out to you. Um, or one of the guys that I work with will reach out to you. Um, so hopefully our website will be up online soon. Um, you can go check out our Instagram and some pictures of some of the cool guns that we, uh, buy and sell in there in the meantime. Um, I really appreciate you having us, um, or having me on the show and gosh, you're a good conversation, uh, Rich. I, I miss you, buddy. I think we got to, next time you come down into town, man, we gotta, we gotta go break bread or something. Yeah. We need to get on the mats. Uh, yeah, we do. Yeah, that that's first, and then we'll go have a beer. All right. 
All right. Uh, T I really appreciate it, TJ. It's been a phenomenal show, man. I come really looking for round two because I left a lot of questions unanswered today that I want to dig into with you, brother. And I, I appreciate you coming on the show. So real quick, I'll just say I don't I don't uh, I am not re representing the opinions of any agency or any person other than myself. Um, what I all I'm representing right now is this mentality. Nobody's coming. It's up to us. Um, but my opinions are my own, not the opinions of my agency or any organization other than mine. That's right. God bless, brother. And uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in this morning. Everybody that's going to watch on YouTube or listen to the podcast, I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate your time, TJ. And listen, take action on some of the things he's saying. It's, it, if you don't, it's just a dream. You got to put it into goals and you got to make take action. So remember, folks, the fight is coming. Be ready.